Welcome. This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. This week we're going to be talking about St. Maximus and his view of the Logoi, Logi, uh, as I've been corrected many times this last week, and his work, Cosmic Liturgy. But principally, we're going to be talking about Dionysius, the Areopagite. And we're going to be talking about his famous work, The Divine Names. How do we name God? How do we speak about a being that is beyond conception, beyond being? How is it possible to speak about the Logi, the Logoi, pre-existing in the divine mind from all eternity, and being the patterns and the archetypes, the principles by which all things were made and that stand and undergird and bind them all together? How is it that there's a common end of all things, a telos, uh, in relationship to these Logoi, Logi? Well, all of that goes back to the controversial debated text of Dionysius, but the divine names, and, and there are many works. He's also known for the ecclesiastical hierarchy and the celestial hierarchy and a small treatise called the Mystical Theology. But we're going to be talking about the first treatise in this book, The Divine Names, and this is about the one of the clearest ways to sum up the orthodox conception of how we speak about God. A lot of people are confused when it comes to apophatic, cataphatic theology, Dionysius will discuss both, but we also want to talk about the energies and we want to, uh, uncreated energies, and we want to talk about the pre-existing archetypes or patterns of all things that are in the mind of God, also known as the exemplars or the logoi, logi. I'm probably never going to be able to do the proper Greek pronunciation, so we might just have to go with logoi. But um, so he's going to begin the book, and by the way, this is a partial video. If you want to watch the full video or hear the full video or the full audio, you'll have to subscribe at Jay's Analysis. But we're going to talk about the essence energy distinction, how it relates to Revelation, how the revealed uh, uh, scriptures, how can they speak about God in such a way that human language is adequately sufficient to convey uh, conceptions or ideas about God. What about notions about God that transcend that, the, those ideas and conceptions? Uh, what about revelation in terms of inspiration? How does it relate to that? What about the possibility of direct perception of God? How does it relate to experiencing God in the liturgy and symbolical theology or sacramental theology? All of that's going to come up. We're going to see a lot of continuity between the Old and New Testament because, surprisingly, the text does not rely on a bunch of Neoplatonic philosophy, as many think. Many think this is just a rehashing of Neoplatonism. And there's a few terms, there's a few areas where there is restatement of Platonic, Neoplatonic ideas, because again, he's speaking to principally a lot of Greek audiences, Greek speaking audiences, a lot of philosophically minded audiences. So, so that is going to be there. So we want to look at the precision of when an idea might be mentioned as a, in a Greek philosopher that's, that's useful or appropriate, and when it's not. But what's interesting is that the surprising amount of sources here are not Greek philosophers, not middle and, and late Platonist or Neoplatonist, but in fact, the Bible. The scriptures are cited hundreds of times. I mean, within a few pages of his text, he's already almost 100 uh, citations of scripture. So there's a very high view of the Bible, which I think would surprise a lot of people who haven't read this text, and most people have not. Most people, even in the realms of theology, haven't actually read the divine names, haven't actually read the celestial hierarchy, the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Uh, a lot of people in Orthodox circles, of course, have. It's very, very popular, very prominent there. But we want to see that it's based on Revelation. We want to see his Trinitarian theology, which is pretty fleshed out, which if there was later revisions to this text or redactions, uh, I would say that the strongest argument for later redactions would be the the very fleshed out uh, Trinitarian theology, which does suggest probably a later age. That doesn't necessarily mean that the entire text was crafted uh, at a very late date, as some of the Renaissance uh, scholars who doubted it, like Lorenzo Valla said. But we'll see that he teaches the full inspiration of Scripture, the continuity of the Old and New Testament. Script, the Old Testament is not done away. It's not uh, fallible. It's not full of errors. We'll see that the terms that are proper to God are said to him in terms of his uncreated energies, 
that's what's revealed to us as humans. They're not statements at all about what he is in himself. No man, no angel, no being knows that. We'll see that the Father is the source of the Godhead, the principal source, the RK, the cause of the of the of deity in, in in the Godhead, that he generates the Son and he spirates the Spirit. There's not a there's no filioque here. There's no double procession. We will see that the energies are explained in much the same way as Saint Basil uh, and other fathers explain the, the divine energies, Saint Gregor Nyssa in against Eunomius as similar to the idea of the sun and the many rays and the heat that come from the sun. So you might have two different rays coming from the sun, but it's the same light that penetrates both. So there's in a sense, one energy in God, which St. John of Damascus will talk about. Uh, and St. Dionysius will talk about. And yet at the same time, that one energy because of, of its procession, uh, its manifestation from one nature uh, is also many. So there's there's a single source, the divine nature, which is simple, which is one, which is unified, and then that multiplicity which comes out from God, which is a procession from God, an eternal manifestation from God, and also a temporal manifestation insofar as some of the energies uh, relate to time and space, as St. Gregory Palmo says. Uh, and they're, therefore they are both one and many. So we're going to see that that already in Dionysius there is this very clear attempt to overcome dialectics, the dialectics of the one and the many, the dialectics of God versus world, God versus man. None of those things are in, di in dialectical tension. He's very fond of using light uh, as one of the key images of God. And there's a curious statement about the true name for God in his argument being the good. So that it does have a philosophical analog. That does relate to philosophers uh, who speculated that the highest one has to be the ultimate good. So there's a key intersection between metaphysics and epistemology, which he also, interestingly, realizes that you can't separate these two. There's no real separation between epistemology and metaphysics. They pre presuppose one another. They go together. They imply necessarily the other. You can't make a statement about metaphysics that also doesn't apply some epistemological truth. So Dionysius will discuss that as well. We're not going to get into the actual debate on the date. That's a very obtuse, very difficult, long debate. Most scholars don't believe that he was uh, the first century father. Uh, I don't profess to know, but I will say this, that what we'll see uh, in my argumentation in the, the full talk uh, I will consider the possibility that the philosophers were influenced by the prophets. Nobody seems to consider this possibility. They, they always view it that it has to be the other way around. Christianity had to have ripped off everything that it has from other sources. Well, it's entirely possible that the philosophers were influenced by Isaiah. Maybe the philosophers read Isaiah. Maybe the philosophers read Moses, right? It's entirely possible. We're also going to talk about the attributes of God, how they differ, and yet are also one in this one and the many that's not a dialectical tension, but is in fact a symphonia, a harmony. We'll talk about the good and the beautiful and how it is fascinating that in the theophany that's given to Samson's parents in Judges 13, it's the name of God there is described as wonderful. And Dionysius is going to make the argument that the name of God is both wonderful and good and beauty and that they all kind of signify the same thing. So the proper name of God is relative to all those things. But I'm going to argue that there is uh, a more clear name of God, uh, and and that's not to exclude what Dionysius is saying, but actually it complements it. It doesn't. It's not an either or. And we're going to find out what what is that lost name of God that uh, that these weird occultists and hermeticists have so long uh, speculated about. We're not going to be involved in any hermetic speculations. We're going to we're just going to talk about the fact that the irony is that this ooh this big secret is actually very clear. We know what the name of God is. It's revealed in Scripture, uh, and there and there's there's not really much debate or question about it, uh, unless one just simply doesn't believe. Then it becomes something else, and it becomes some kind of magical password where you got to like you know in some secret society come up with the magic password, but we're not going to play magic password here to 
uh, become wizards and warlocks and play Dungeons and Dragons. We're going to talk about real theology and historical theology and the liturgy and how the, the Logoi are the same as what the West calls the Exemplars. I made an article about this 10 years ago uh, and got attacked over it. It's right here in Dionysus. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, how it's possible to speak about something in negation and it have a, a sensible meaning. How is it possible to predicate of God and to say that God is love while also at the same time recognizing that love is not a full description of him, that it's not a univocal statement of him, that it is analogical and it does re- reply, it does refer to an aspect of what God has revealed to us, but it does not refer to the totality of God because there's no single term or concept that encompasses the totality of who God is or what God is, which is even more impossible. We're going to see how in Dionysius we need to be precise with talking about the possibility that we can say that God exists, but that's also not a definition of his essence. And in fact, when he says, I am that I am, this is not a, in Exodus 3.14, this is not a justification of the Western scholastic philosophical approach to defining in some way the divine, the divine essence as being uh, or any other predicate. They're not. They are definitions or statements or predicates of the divine energies, the uncreated energies. This is what St. Basil says in his famous epistle 234. So we're going to, we're going to see all that uh, and we're going to go really deep into each one of the, the sections. It's about a hundred, 120 page work. We're going to dissect that at, in full. If you want to hear that, you can subscribe to Jay's analysis. Uh, be sure to click like and share below. Uh, and this will probably be posted in the next day or two. Usually the full talks takes me a day or two afterwards when this uploads to to get that fixed and um, add to it and whatnot. So uh, click like, click share, follow my stuff. And thank you for listening and watching.